I'm just going to make a little announcement before we start since I have just a few minutes and we'll certainly finish on time. So just for everybody's interest, um, this is going to be the last lecture series um, before April. Okay, we're going to reconvene. I think it's April 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, April 5th is going to be our old friend Caleb Alexander going to talk about April, April 6th. April 6th, thank you. Okay, April 6th, Wednesday, April 6th. So that we have a couple of uh, weeks off, a couple of Wednesdays. Um, but ending the winter quarter, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Rana Hogarth is an associate professor of history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her talk is titled, The Shadow of Slavery in the Era of Eugenics. Charles B. Davenport's Race Crossing Studies. Rana Hogarth holds, uh, is an uh, Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She holds her PhD in History with the concentration in History of Science and History of Medicine from Yale University. She also has an MHS in Health Policy from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Policy. Her work and research focuses on medical and scientific constructions of race during the era of slavery and beyond. Her scholarship brings together the fields of African American history, history of medicine, and Atlantic world history. In her first book, Medicalizing Blackness, Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, 1780 to 1840, Professor Hogarth examines how white physicians medicalized blackness a term she uses to describe the process by which white physicians define blackness as a medically significant marker of difference in slave societies of the um, American Atlantic. Her second project examines the genealogy and deployment of terms used to describe mixed race offspring of black and white people such as mulatto or quadroon in American medical and lay discourse. It traces how these terms were used in colonial Caribbean context and in the mainland North America during the era of slavery and illuminates how American eugenicists adopted these terms to correlate mental and physical capacities of mixed race people to um, their racial ancestral makeup. In doing so, they refashioned these terms from crude labels to precision tools with valid scientific meanings. In the early 20th century, American eugenicists looked southward to the Caribbean to conduct race crossing studies, um, viewing that region as an ideal experimental site to undertake the study of a topic once considered taboo in the United States during that time. The results of these studies gave credence to the notion that race was a fixed and quantifiable biological feature and confirm white anxieties about the perils of race, racial mixing. Finally, this project centers on the Caribbean ex-slave colonies as experimental spaces that allowed eugenicists to extract data from mixed race people for the benefit of American scientists and the lay public. Ron has received the George S. and Gladys W. Queen Award for Excellence in Teaching in the History Department in the University of Illinois. The Arts and Sciences Dean Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, the Provost Campus Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, and the Helen Corley Pettit Scholar, all in 2020, the period of time when most of us were trying to just come to terms with COVID. Um, her books include Medicalizing Blackness, Racial Differences in the Atlantic World. She also has a number of other publications, including the American Journal of Public Health, the American Quarterly, African and Black Diaspora. And in a couple of weeks, Rana will be one of the featured speakers at the National Library of Medicine. So it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our next speaker, our colleague, my friend, Rana Hogarth, to give a terrific talk that's timely and appropriate. Um, oh my gosh, thank, thank you so much for this very generous introduction. Um, I, I really do want to say um, a very big thank you for inviting me to share your, my work with you today. Um, I'm actually kind of, um, I'm, I'm honored and a little intimidated to be included with such um, distinguished uh, lecturers in this series. 
Um, many of the speakers um, are trailblazers in the history of medicine. Um, I have great admiration for them. Um, and I actually read a lot of their books for my qualifying exams. And I'm not trying to like date anybody, but I'm just trying to basically say that their work actually transformed on the field and their work is enduring and amazing. So um, I also want to just have a big um, thank you to Dr. Mindy Schwartz, who's just been the most amazing friend and wonderful supporter. Um, I really appreciate being a part of this. And thank you so much, Mindy, for having me here. I'm, I'm hoping one day I'll get to like see you not in a Zoom box, but like in person and give you a big hug. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and um, going to share with you uh, some of my um, research. And what I want to do, if I can just hide this, there we go. So um, a couple of things I wanted to just say, um, you all are sort of going to be um, guinea pigs in a little bit, no sense, because of, this is part of my new work. So this is um, from my second book project. Um, so I'm testing out some ideas here and I'm sharing some of my preliminary uh, data with you. The other thing that I want to do is just offer um, a content warning for the audience. Um, so there's going to be certain language that will appear in my talk um, that includes terms like Negro, racial hybrid, miscegenation, mulatto, octoroon, et cetera. Um, these are all terms that are going to appear in my presentation today, but I only use those terms to stay in keeping with the terminology of the historical context. Uh, and my use of these terms is in no way um, an endorsement. So um, my talk today is going to focus on slavery and eugenics, uh, two topics that are not frequently discussed together, I found. Um, now, I deliberately like, chose this challenge for myself for a number of reasons. Uh, one, um, as Dr. Schwartz mentioned, um, I'm trained as a historian of medicine, but I bring together African-American history, um, Atlantic world slavery, uh, the African diaspora and the history of Western medicine and public health all together in my research. Um, and I am interested in how race was made in North America and the Anglophone Caribbean. Um, I focus generally on the era of slavery, but as you'll see, I'm kind of dipping my toes into the 20th century. Um, and essentially what I do with my research um, is to illuminate how the system of slavery um, and the creation of race were actually mutually constitutive. And they are in fact um, responsible for the ideas about innate racial difference that still, um, I would argue, linger with us today. So in a nutshell, you might say that I'm uh, quite interested in how race became thought of as an element of biology. Uh, now, eugenics was very much premised on biological determinism. And I wanted to sort of explore um, if the biological determinism of the eugenics era built upon the same kind of biological determination of the era of slavery. Um, so this is sort of my research trajectory and explains how I got to where I am. Um, I spent a lot of time reading through medical writings and scientific writings to see how and when race emerges um, and what, significant, what significance it has um, with respect to the development of um, medical knowledge um, and advancing and progressing the field. Now, um, a number of uh, you know, scholars will say, okay, I, was, I stumbled across this while working on my first book. Um, and for me, that's also true. I should be you know, honest. I also was interested in this prior to writing the first book. I actually wrote a graduate seminar paper on eugenics and slavery, and um, you know, I kind of put it aside. And as I started working on the first book, I just kind of really focused on the 18th um, and early 19th century. Um, and a lot of the research questions I, I found were actually kind of um, similar in terms of this theme of how did race become sort of viewed as something biological. So for my first book, the research questions um, for that project really converged around how white physicians were producing and circulating and institutionalizing medical knowledge about blackness. So that means that I was looking at this as a, as a process, right? Um, I was also thinking about, you know, where these um, ideas about racial difference might appear just like as like two or three sentences, a paragraph, an aside in bigger, broader um, medical treatises. Um, and I noticed that every time race was brought up or blackness was brought up, it was sort of talked about as if it was a real thing that one could see and, and, and notice at the bedside that had um, significance. So the other thing that I found in doing um, my, my, my research is that really this wasn't about protecting slavery. So this was sort of one of the big interventions. Um, a lot of prior work had suggested that some of the very wrong-headed and false ideas about um, racial difference 
stems from a desire for pro-slavery physicians to sort of defend the institution and say, oh, there's a biological reason for this and, and this is why things have to be unequal. But what I actually found was that physicians had actually been medicalizing blackness um, just out of sort of seeing difference. It didn't really matter um, necessarily about protecting slavery. And I talked quite a bit about um, physicians who are actually opposed to slavery, who also participated in this. One of the concerns though, was that I would stumble across in doing this research was that there might've been a reference to somebody who was mixed race. And it was not always uniform, which uh, sort of uh, parent race they uh, were sort of following in terms of their sickness. So for example, a physician might write in the 18th century, uh, these are the people that are uh, liable to get yellow fever. And they would say white uh, Europeans, and then they would say uh, mulattoes, mixed race people were liable to get it. But then they will say black people do not get it. And I thought, okay, well, well why? Because technically we're looking at people who are mixed race. Why wouldn't they be immune much like black people? So these are some of the ways in which I started thinking about how does this idea of naming blackness um, as a clinical marker or something that's significant in terms of health, how did that work for mixed race people? Um, so really, it is true that in writing the first book, um, a lot of new questions were raised for me. Um, if anything, I wanted to know how was each racial component of a mixed race person viewed in lay and scientific discourses? So what, what was the thought process? How did that work? And, and when did this really start taking place in earnest? Um, in fact, I wanted to know sort of what the logic was behind it, if slavery had anything to do with this. And I started to think through, um, you know, what other instances are there of physicians um, thinking about race in this way? Um, and of course, that led me to studies of mixed race people. And it turns out, of course, that there were quite a few studies of mixed race people in the early 20th century conducted by eugenicists. There are studies on um, racial crosses between um, Chinese and Native Hawaiians. Um, there, there's a whole um, slew of work by um, Leslie Dunn, who was um, sort of an early 20th century figure in sort of the anthropology movement where he was actually looking at mixed race people. And so I thought, okay, this was clearly something of interest. But I also started to think about, okay, what did this mean for people who are mixed with white and black ancestry? Um, and it turns out that Charles Davenport, who I will talk um, at length about today, um, really was sort of the pioneer in focusing on um, black and white uh, so-called racial hybrids and trying to understand their fitness, their health, um, and sort of assess them. So this is sort of how I ended up at my second book project, which I'm tentatively titling Measuring Miscegenation, the Legacies of Slavery and Eugenic Race Crossing Studies. And so, as I said before, what I want to do, the sort of simple question is, um, you know, to examine how eugenicists came to measure mixed race people, those of black and white ancestry, and classify them as physically, mentally, and socially unfit. Um, so this project is going to describe how slavery era ideas um, related to racial fitness, endurance, intelligence, and abilities um, of people with African ancestry actually laid the ideological groundwork for eugenic race crossing studies um, in the early 20th century. Um, I should say, and I'm going to kind of put on my historian hat here, um, if we think about sort of the long history of, of thinking about racial mixture, um, we can see a history of discomfort. Um, indeed, um, white American commentators often referred to mixed race people as sort of unnatural um, products of an unspoken but much carried on uh, racial transgression. Uh, in the United States, obviously, where there's legal, there was legal and social prescriptions against black and white sexual and marital relations, um, the persistence of mulattoes or mixed race people implied that interracial sex was actually a feature and not an aberration. It was continuing. It had been uh, of concern from the era of slavery and it continued to be a concern. And so, of course, slavery itself created the material conditions for racial mixing to take place. So what I found is that mixed race people with black and white ancestry were not necessarily unique. They had always sort of been seen as this problem group. Um, and I was interested in understanding the trajectory of the scrutiny of their bodies, how they became objectified um, and, discussed and dis uh, discussed and described with curiosity, desire, and revulsion by those concerned about the future of racial fitness and purity across the Americas. And this is, of course, 
absolutely the case in the era of eugenics if we, we think about the um, early decades of the 20th century. Now, that said, I was super excited about this project. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna see what other folks have written about mixed race people in eugenics. Um, and I actually found that um, there was not a whole lot. Um, so there is no shortage of work on mixed race people in, in general. Um, there is no shortage of work on the history of eugenics at all. But what I found is that there were few works that were explicitly dedicated to examining how mixed race people's bodies were socially constructed by eugenicism. Um, now, I think, and, and this is sort of um, my uh, hypothesis I have, a lot of this has to do with how we view eugenics. Um, often it's referred to immediately as um, a pseudoscience, um, that we look back on it now today and say, okay, that was obviously nonsense. And I always take the view that, you know, I'm not gonna be present as in the moment, I'm going to say, this is the context. These individuals like Charles Davenport um, and others, um, Aros Herdlika, they were funded by the government. They were taken quite seriously. They applied for grants. They published papers that were peer reviewed. We can't just say, okay, they were all just wrong and forget about it. I try to situate myself within the context to understand like how this um, actually um, gathered momentum and was considered to be legitimate science. We also think of eugenics as um, naturally bound up with a sort of anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-Semitism, ableism. Um, all of those things are quite true, right? When we think about studies of eugenics, these are sort of the themes that um, uh, emerge. So I would actually say though, that we can take a more expansive view of eugenics. Um, one that includes uh, early ideas about quantifying and measuring humans' capabilities and racial fitness through anthropological and anthropometric study. And I actually, you know, in, in thinking through, I obviously had to read through a lot of um, really great books. And so, for example, um, uh, Daniel Kevlis, who's very well known as a historian of science and a leading scholar of eugenics, um, you know, he pointed out that 20 years before Francis Galton actually coined the term eugenics. So that's 1883 is when we say the, the term eugenics is coined by Galton. Um, he had already had um, some ideas about fitness. So um, you'll see here, this is an image um, of, his, um, of Galton's hereditary genius. This is published in 1869. And there I would say is where uh, Galton is dabbling in ideas on how to improve human stock. I would go as far as saying that Galton had a nascent understanding of racial fitness well before eugenics really comes onto the scene. And as he thought about racial fitness, Galton did not hesitate to pronounce black people as mentally inept. In Galton's musings that appeared in um, Hereditary Genius, um, we actually see him using language that's quite explicit about a, a racialized idea of fitness or intelligence. So Kevlis notes that hereditary genius is one of Galton's first attempts to investigate the origins of so-called natural abilities. Um, Galton contemplated the intellectual capacities of non-whites, and he theorized that, quote, Negro intelligence was on average two grades below that of the English, and evidently not a sign of good stock. So um, Galton continues, quote, the number among the Negroes of those whom we shall call half-witted men is very large. Every book alluding to Negro servants in America is full of instances. I myself was much impressed by this fact during my travels in Africa, end quote. So essentially Galton is saying, here are the sort of gradations of people who I consider to have high intellectual abilities and those that don't. He references um, people of African descent, he draws on his own knowledge from his travels throughout Africa, um, of which there's a lot of rich material, but he also makes this reference to so-called quote, Negro servants in America saying, this is where I'm drawing on some of that information. So what we see in um, Galton's writing is someone who's willing to collapse fitness, um, mental and physical, into a feature of one's race. And I would say that Galton is using this terminology as if it is a feature of one's biology. Um, historian Marius Turda, who's also um, a really well-known um, historian of eugenics, has actually mentioned that with respect to Galton's writing, while he didn't define race, he did use it frequently and he understood it um, biologically speaking to be, quote, a community of people sharing similar physiological and psychological characteristics transmitted from one generation to the next, end quote. So what we, that means is that when we're employing this idea of eugenics, um, we can start to think about how non-white people, including people with black ancestry and black and white ancestry, 
became targeted by those who are interested in assessing their fitness. Beyond that, we can consider that this group of people were subject to intense scrutiny of their um, abilities well before we have this sort of formal advent of eugenics in the early 20th century. Um, and so what I wanna do is consider this long history, if you will, of medical and scientific assessment of mixed race people. Um, and it turns out that if we kind of go backwards in time, we can find quite a bit of written commentary on mixed race people from the era of slavery. And it shows this very long preoccupation with the fitness of mixed race people. And of course, projections um, of fears about racial purity. So um, one thing that I, I thought about was, okay, well, here's Galton in 1869 saying this, um, where might we also see this? And in thinking about reframing the targets um, of the eugenic gaze, um, I was drawn to the United States Sanitary Commission um, study. There was a study that was conducted, uh, this is during the Civil War, by the Union. So they conducted a very large um, anthropological study on the fitness of soldiers. So this is, um, this is published in 1869, but the data is collected um, during the war. And this particular study, as I said, um, it's the U.S. Sanitary Commission study of um, investigations of the military and anthropological statistics of American soldiers. This study not only relied on, relied on anthropometry in its section on black troops' bodies um, and including troops that were categorized as mulatto, but it became an actual kind of clearinghouse of data on the fitness of these men. Now, when I'm talking about anthropometry here, I'm talking about the idea of measuring um, physical human proportion. So they would measure things like um, chest, like the girth, the chest, their height, their stature. Um, they went and looked at um, how much hair was on the body. So they actually were really truly examining and observing um, these men. Now, it's really important here to think about what this means that the Union Army, while fighting this war to end slavery, is really interested in ferreting out and understanding innate racial differences. Um, this particular study was conducted under the aegis of Benjamin A. Gould. Now, Gould was actually not a physician. Um, he went on to have a distinguished career as an astronomer. Um, he was also an actuary, um, but he sort of was in charge of this study, of this, of this data. And he indeed felt that there were innate differences between black, white, and mulatto troops. Um, and I should say that historians um, such as Margaret Humphreys, um, Lundy Braun, and Leslie Schwalm um, have also used this particular source um, to sort of say, look, here is a very troubling uh, collection of data that feeds into this idea of innate racial difference. And I should say that um, beyond that, uh, Gould's approach to studying and measuring humans was actually quite influential. So here is just sort of a snapshot here from the study. So you'll see I've highlighted this portion in examining Negro troops um, give answers to question 30, an estimate of the proportion of black blood, such as full black, mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, as well as of the Negro race. So just to give you a sense here, a questionnaire was sent out to military surgeons in which they were supposed to either eyeball it or ask the men, okay, what are you? Explain this to me. And then answer questions about their bodies, about their intelligence, about what they could do. Could they read, could they write, et cetera. So I just wanna sort of highlight, as I like to say, I always wanna um, be transparent as a historian. So these are like the sources that I'm working with and this is sort of the kind of data that I use when thinking about the significance of race and how it appears in some of these um, scientific studies. Now I should say that um, this is all again, spearheaded by Gould and Gould's work is actually quite um, influential. So we can think about um, what it means to have the civil war, right? The civil war going on and the creation and collection of this data during the civil war, helping to sort of boost anthropometry and anthropology as a legitimate means of assessing racial fitness and reading fitness onto differently raised bodies. So for example, this is a excerpt from a paper that Davenport wrote later on in the 20th century called The Measurement of Men. And he is basically saying, what are some of the, the, the methods? How do we do this? And he actually mentions that Gould's study, right, the idea of measuring soldiers, that is sort of a model for how one does this. And I should say that Gould comes up again as sort of a reference point of like, oh, here's a person who knows how to measure men, how to measure um, these racial differences. 
So what I would like to say then is that we should be certainly considering how slavery and its legacies actually laid the foundations for methodologies and research questions um, and assumptions that eugenicists had when they started to try and precision measure mulattoes and other people of mixed race. Now, in my slide, uh, to my, 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 my talk today is really going to focus on Charles Davenport. And of course, here is the image here. Um, as I said before, Davenport has really led the way, and he was a little bit unique um, in his um, very, very negative views of mixed race people. So um, he uh, published two race crossing studies. Um, the first one, the 1913 study, which is the heredity of skin color and Negro white crosses, and his follow up um, 1929 study, Race Crossing in Jamaica. I should add here that. Um, Race crossing in Jamaica was just panned. It was just I mean, his peers, his colleagues, other eugenicists found his methodology and his grasp of um, uh, genetics to be completely faulty. Um, that said, they were more annoyed with his methods. Um, some people felt like, okay, fine, we disagree, we agree with you that race crossing is bad, but we don't like your methods. Um, and Davenport also stood out for having the belief that there was no hybrid vigor when blacks and whites mix. So this idea of if you mix these distinctive groups of people, perhaps there will be sort of an improvement. Davenport sort of stands out as saying there will not be. So um, the other thing that I think is also quite fascinating here is that it was not only white eugenicists and white anthropologists and, and sociologists and scientists who were interested in this question of mixed race people. Um, what's been fascinating about doing this research um, before the pandemic, um, I was able to look at the papers of Carolyn Von Day, who herself was a mixed race woman. She also trained at Harvard like Charles Davenport. Um, she received a master's in anthropology and she studied under Ernest Houghton. And she actually published her master's thesis, which is called The Study of Some Negro White Families in the United States. She publishes this after um, Davenport's 1929 race crossing study. And in my, my, my preliminary research, I see these works as in conversation with each other. And in fact, what Carolyn Von Day tries to do is she does use the same kind of anthropometric measurements. So she goes and, and measures and, and queries people about their ancestries. Um, but she basically tries to say, mixed race people are not intellectual. They contribute much to society. They are perfectly racially fit, but she does appropriate some of this kind of similar language that um, other anthropologists and eugenicists would use. And so really, Day wants to kind of use these same methods, but really does so to underscore the great civic and intellectual accomplishments um, of mixed race people. So I want to kind of just jump ahead to say, OK, well, what does Davenport, what was it that Davenport said about mixed race people specifically? Well, I will tell you, in a 1917 article, he declared that mulattoes were, quote, a nuisance to others, end quote. He surmised that these hybridized people were, quote, badly put together and ineffective, end quote. Now, this is, uh, these statements come from an article that appeared in the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society. And this was just one of many publications where Davenport um, outlined the dangers of race crossing and the problems with mixed race people. Davenport noted, quote, mulattoes combine something of a white man's intelligence and ambition with an insufficient intelligence to realize that ambition, end quote. Now, he doesn't specifically say that it's the mulatto's Black ancestry that is the source of this deep defect in ambition and intelligence, but it was certainly implied. Um, indeed, a glance at his um, body of work uh, basically shows us that there is little doubt that anti-Black racism certainly framed his view of um, mixed race people's bodies. So in looking at his papers and looking at some of his studies, I actually found that when he was answering questions about mixed race people or thinking about his methods, like what question do I want to answer? He was very much informed by slavery era assumptions and hearsay and myths about mixed race people. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of those myths and then kind of show you how Davenport either addressed them. In some cases, he tried to debunk these myths with using precision science. But the point being is that he is looking back towards the era of slavery in framing his approach to studying mixed race people such as mulattoes. So let's talk about myth making of mixed race people's bodies. Um, I want to walk you through some of the conjectures from physicians in particular who um, actually played up or heightened the physical limitations of mixed race people. I'll start with a, a let's say an easy example, a pro-slavery physician and editor of the Memphis Medical Reporter, A.P. Merrill, 
who complained loudly in 1855 that mulattoes were, quote, less curable than white persons on account of their greater feebleness of constitution, end quote. Um, I could also give you sort of a laundry list of pro-slavery physicians, but let's think about those who were maybe opposed to slavery. So for example, um, Benjamin A. Gould, who I've mentioned before, um, actually noted the, quote, well-known phenomenon of mulatto's inferior vitality, end quote. So this is Gould, again, on the union side, saying that, no, they're actually very weak. Uh, now, I will say that there wasn't always a uniform view amongst um, union medical officers. So for example, J.H. Baxter, who was the chief medical officer for the Provost Marshal General, um, actually wrote a study or, or uh, compiled a study where he noted that some black troops, some mixed race troops were fairly suitable for service. He didn't see a problem with them. But in his excerpts of reports from other sort of military officers who were meant to assess the men, there was a sort of constant or, or sort of an undercurrent of them claiming that mulattoes were not as um, strong as pure or full blacks. So this is again giving you a sense of both sides, both those who are pro-slavery, opposed to slavery, and their views of physical assessment and race. So these are all from um, around the 1860s, 1870s. Now for Davenport, he is looking back in time. And when I say he's looking back in time, he goes all the way to the 18th century. And I will tell you what I mean in just a moment. So we can think about um, this myth about mulatto people being innately weak. Um, uh, or having the inability to reproduce together, which was another really big myth that circulated in the era of slavery. Um, we can actually find such references in 1774. So really going back in time, uh, the Anglo-Jamaican planter Edward Long wrote that it was quote, extraordinary that two mulattoes should be unable to continue their species. The women either proving barren or their offspring, if they have any, not attaining to maturity. The subject deserves a further and very attentive inquiry, end quote. So this is a 1774 uh, pro-slavery planter in Jamaica making this claim. And he says it deserves further attentive inquiry. Well, it certainly received further and attentive inquiry in the 19th century. Um, Josiah Knott, who was a pro-slavery physician, in 1843 penned an article called, quote, the mulatto, a hybrid, probable extermination of the two races if whites and blacks are allowed to intermarry clear political overtones going on here. Um, basically, not says it's true. Mixed race people, they can't reproduce together. And he devotes a whole article to this. Um, it appears in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal in 1843. And in it, he actually cites Edward Long, the, seventh, the 18th century planter, not claimed that Long, who is a high authority in his history of Jamaica, asserts unhesitatingly that the male and female mulatto do not produce so many children together. He also uh, not also noted that, quote, um, mulattoes have shorter lifespans than either whites and blacks, and the women were plagued by, quote, physiological delicacy and an inability to conceive children, end quote. Now, we can think about the political context in which these two um, pro-slavery uh, commentators uh, lived, but what's interesting is that if we flash forward to the 20th century, when Davenport publishes his first study on the heredity of skin color and Negro white crosses, one of the things he wants to do is to debunk the myth that uh, there is a, a problem of infertility. And he actually specifically names Edward Long and Josiah Knott in his 20th century discussion of this. So he says that, you know, yes, there are many problems with mulatto bodies. That there's a lot of difficulty in predicting the skin color of so-called these hybrid crosses. But Davenport admits, quote, there's no support in our data for the notion of a lack of fecundity of Negro white crosses, nor of their deficient viability, end quote. And when he says that they are, this is completely untrue, as I say, he points directly to these slavery era commentators. To me, this suggests that in doing his scientific work and collecting his data, however precise he thinks he is, he still felt the need to kind of harken back to this kind of lore about mixed race people, which had endured for quite some time. I also wanted to just mention that Davenport tries to add some nuance to claims that mulattoes are innately weak. So in an undated lecture, um, he uh, talks about race crossing, Davenport does. And he says, quote, the Negro has many advantages in physical quality over the white. He's much less apt to suffer defects of the spine, goiter, obesity, deaf mutism, and deafness. 
mulattoes show much of the excellent qualities of the Negro, end quote. Now, I want to be clear, in Davenport saying this, he's not actually progressive or trying to rehabilitate um, mulatto people, because in that same lecture, he says that mulattoes show an extraordinarily high rate of tuberculosis, and the venereal disease rate is several times higher than among the whites, end quote. So he doesn't see them as being uh, going to be extinct or inability to reproduce. Instead, he kind of transfers them into being vectors for possibly spreading diseases, tuberculosis, which is, of course, a great concern in the early 20th century, considered to be contagious, and of course, venereal disease, also a concern at this time in the 20th century. So what I'm seeing here is Davenport is saying, okay, those are all myths. The real problem with mulattoes is this, and I have the data to prove it. And again, this is for me, seeing this kind of trajectory of an interest in this kind of um, these mixed race people and sort of using science to sort of um, shape the narrative around them. Um, and in Davenport's cases, he thinks that he's being objective and he thinks that he's used, relying on data and not hearsay, but he's still propagating these equally um, damaging um, um, sort of racially deterministic ideas. Another um, really interesting uh, thing that I found about doing this research is sort of the discussion of physical appearance, so physical characteristics, and how some of the ideas about physical characteristics of mixed race people from the era of slavery linger through in 20th century studies. So for example, um, we can think about um, the writings of, mixed, uh, of people from the 18th century about um, mixed race features. So we can look back to Edward Long, uh, 1774, where he writes, quote, of mulattoes, they seem to partake more of the white than the black. Their hair has a natural curl. In some, it resembles Negro fleece, but in general, it is of a tolerable length, end quote. So Long, this is again, 18th century slave owning planter who's writing about the features of mixed race people. And his attention to mulatto hair, you might say, okay, this is a trivial physical characteristic, but in reality, it had much greater meaning. Um, I say this because Davenport, especially the um, eugenics record office, actually has specimens of mixed race people's hair. Um, I, I have to tell you, I was doing research at the um, American Philosophical Society in 2019, and this was not in the finding aid. So like I like opened an envelope and like human hair like fell out. So I was a little bit, it was a jarring experience, but this sort of goes to the point that eugenicists were quite interested in measuring and capturing these physical, these features, these characteristics of mixed race hair. So Davenport uh, spilled quite a bit of ink talking about the color and texture of mixed race hair. Um, in fact, in all of his family pedigree analyses that he published in his 1913 study, um, he noted the color, length, and texture of mixed race hair. Um, and the Eugenics Record Office, um, which was founded by Davenport in 1910, actually housed data collected from families some of which included these hair specimens. So um, this is an example from a dossier labeled the McDonough family. Uh, they sent their family tree to the ERO, uh, the eugenics record office. Um, it was in an envelope labeled Negro White Cross. And there is a hair sample from the mother, father, two daughters, and other family members. Now I am still trying to figure out how and why it is this family um, who hailed from Jamaica sent their hair to the eugenics record office in the United States. Um, but the fact that it's there and that Davenport spent a lot of time studying this and talking about it to me is quite significant. So um, we can also think about um, how he relates uh, having hair texture to the expectations of what mixed race people should look like. So he writes in the 1913 study, in how far is the absence or presence of Negro skin pigment associated with the absence or pre presence of other Negro characteristics. There are two traits that are associated with dark pigmentation of the skin in the Negro, of which we can trace the association of the offspring of hybrids, namely the color of the hair and the form of hair, degree of curving. Now, Davenport did concede, quote, black skin color and woolly hair are closely associated in purebred Negroes, but this association is, quote, accidental, end quote. Davenport nevertheless saw kinky or woolly hair as a so-called Negro trait. He also thought that uh, certain typical Negro features such as a flat nose, thick lips, woolly kinky hair was again something that was a specifically designed Negro trait, but he did recognize that there were cases where 
a lighter skinned person could have some of these uh, so-called traits. And you'll see here, I have these arrows just giving you a sense of the use of this terminology. So there is, uh, you know, the octoroon daughter has curly, but not at all kinky hair by a white man had. At the bottom, you see a reference to a son with a swarthy complexion, a deeply tan skin with much yellow, dark brown eyes and hair that shows a trace of a tendency to curl. So again, this is not trivial. This is quite serious for eugenicists to really pay attention to every inch of the body to see if you can actually see these traits, these black traits coming through. And again, I wanna remind us that what Edward Long just mentioned as an aside that he noted in living in a slave society, here we have a eugenicist writing down and taking very copious notes on the significance of such features. Now, um, Davenport does conclude that he does not see a correlation between skin color and the curliness of the hair. Um, I will say that Carolyn Von Day, who I mentioned before, also did collect samples um, from mixed race people. Um, her papers, which are at the um, Peabody Museum Archives at Harvard, um, those hair samples are kind of tucked away. And I would also say that because of the delicate nature of her interviewing her um, subjects in the Southern United States, many people may have been passing. And so a lot of the, the hair samples are anonymous. So she doesn't want to connect people. She actually tried to maintain people's um, anonymity uh, simply because of the taboos around race crossing and the possibility of people passing. So um, I also wanted to kind of say, you know, this is what scientists are talking about, people who are measuring, um, looking at this intently. I wanted to draw your attention to lay people, like so just non-trained professional scientists who are interested in, in racial mixture and in features as well. So um, again, in doing some work at the uh, American Philosophical Society, reading through some of Davenport's papers, I stumbled across this letter, which both talks about features, but also the specter of slavery and understanding um, sort of the approaching the study of mixed race people. So this is a letter that Davenport received. It's from 1928, and it's from the wife of the school superintendent in Michigan. And I'll just read a little bit um, from it. Um, quote, the township of Calvin is largely inhabited by colored people, declared Mrs. Edmund Shou in her 1928 letter to Davenport. She provided a brief history of the mixed race population of Cass County, Michigan, mentioning how Cass County, Michigan was pulled into several stops on the Underground Railroad. Indeed, Calvin Township in Cass County had a non-trivial number of black residents in the mid 19th century. Some even arrived accompanying their white owners. And you will see here um, that sort of highlighted portion. Um, Mrs. Schotzow reveals the open secret of interracial mixing frankly referencing the white planter who brought his, quote, slaves, some of whom were his children, end quote. So the idea is that how did these people come into Michigan? Well, they were brought over by slave owners, and you can sort of get to see sort of this idea of where slavery fits in with this idea of propagating mixed race people. Um, she mentions, um, for example, that some families are able to pass for white. So this is the first page of the letter where she basically says, a lot of these people came up from slavery. They were brought over by white owners who, fathered their, who were the father of the children. In her next letter, she then starts to talk about the features of some of the mixed race people that she knows about. So she says, quote, other families with white blood are the Lawsons, Mornings, and some of the Stewarts. The Bunn family are light too, look like white people. Many times those who are light in complexion have Negro features and vice versa. Now I should say, she also mentions um, by name a young woman who is actually passing for white and teaches in Denver. Now you might think, okay, this is just a nosy neighbor. Outing somebody who's passing in the early 20th century when lynching is at an all-time high during sort of the nadir of race relations, when you think about what that means, is extremely dangerous. But what we have here is a neighbor, a nosy neighbor who's interested in eugenics, who writes to the ERO, who wants to share this information with somebody like Charles Davenport. And in doing so, she feeds right into this idea of here is sort of where they came from, directly tied to slavery. Look at their features. It's so hard to tell. They all look, you know, very mixed and you might mistake them. Now, what she reflects on as an amateur eugenicist is of a serious concern for somebody like Davenport. Because Davenport writes, quote, from observation of skin color alone, one cannot draw an accurate conclusion as to the genetic constitution of a person, end quote. And he mentions that, he makes that statement 
in his 1929 race crossing study. Um, and this is certainly something that's articulated by Mrs. Schotzow. Davenport actually acknowledged the challenges of this kind of racial dilution. He says, quote, with such extreme dilution with white, the progeny pass for white optically, socially, and politically, end quote. So this undermines the notion of racial purity, but it also in a sense justifies what Davenport is doing in saying that he can ferret out and study and pay attention to these features so that one could know if somebody was passing and crossing the color line, that one could know sort of if somebody was going to marry and possibly have a so-called quote tainted bloodline. So other aspects um, where we see these issues of, of sort of relating to slavery and the study of mixed race people emerges um, certainly in claims about intelligence. And some of the mythology about so-called mixed race intelligence, we can most certainly trace to the era of slavery. Um, this belief of uh, intermediate intelligence of mixed race people being at, sort of in the middle between black at the lowest mixed race in the middle and white at the top um, is something that's very prevalent in antebellum writing. So for example, in a, uh, a publication on agriculture in the Southern United States from 1852, the author noted, quote, it appears at all events certain that the mixed race exhibits powers more susceptible to cultivation than the pure African. They are selected at the South for the performance of duties requiring higher capacities than are possessed by the mere field Negro. At, and at the North, every day's observation shows that the mulatto is endowed with mental gifts superior to his black brother, end quote. Now I should add here that this idea that um, mulattoes were so-called were highly intelligent very much lingers into the 20th century. In fact, University of Chicago trained sociologist E.B. Reuter, uh, who publishes a book entitled The Superiority of the Mulatto, 1917, notes that, quote, in all times in the history of the American Negro and in all fields of human effort in which Negroes have entered, the successful individuals with very few exceptions have been mulattoes, end quote. So what Reuter does is actually takes up this 1852 notion of, oh, of course, mixed race people have intermediate and much um, higher intelligence. And this is sort of because of their white ancestry, which is what is implied. Davenport, however, was not convinced. So in Race Crossing in Jamaica, um, which is title page pictured here, Davenport goes out of his way to make the claim that mixed race people are actually less intelligent. Um, and what he does is that he kind of does this in a very kind of tricky way of how he interprets the data. So this is what he says. Um, he first concedes that mulattoes were, were indeed in between blacks and whites with respect to their scores on intelligence tests, but he saw in mulattoes a potential for wide variation. According to Davenport, they were prone to having individuals of unusually low intelligence in their group in relation to whites and blacks. So he summed this up in a quite lengthy quote. This is from um, a lecture called, Is the Crossing of the Races Useful? Davenport write, writes, quote, the whites scored higher than the blacks while the browns scored an intermediate score. But a study of the distribution of grades showed in many cases this remarkable fact that about 5% of the browns received lower scores than any of the blacks or whites. In the different tests, it's not always the same individual who thus scores extraordinarily low. Thus, the result is not due merely to a chance inclusion among the Browns of some individuals of unusually low intelligence. Rather, among the various Browns are individuals who find themselves unable to even start the beginning of a mental test. There are fewer full-blooded Blacks who show such complete incapacity. It seems reasonable to ascribe this idiosyncrasy of the Browns to their hybrid nature, end quote. So he's basically saying that because they are mixed race, there are these people that are just unable to even begin a basic intelligence test. And I will add here that the tests that Davenport relied on are known as the, quote, Knox Moron tests or the Knox Imitation Cube test and Army Alpha test. So this is sort of where he, how he collects the data and the results are of course published in Race Crossing in Jamaica. Now, finally, I wanna just mention a few things about where he conducts his studies. So I mentioned a nosy neighbor in Michigan. I mentioned Carolyn Bonday, who did collect her data in the Southern United States. But I would argue as a mixed race woman, she was maybe able to get a closeness to her subjects that Davenport was not able to. Um, and what he did is he decided to go to the West Indies, to the English speaking Caribbean to co conduct his studies. Hence, race crossing in Jamaica is conducted there for that reason. I would also add that his first study in 1913 was also conducted um, in Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, and parts of Bermuda. What Davenport does 
is he has his field workers go to Jamaica and interview Jamaicans and other inhabitants of English-speaking Caribbean islands because he assumed that there, there were lax attitudes about racial mixture and he felt that he could get the data that he wanted. And essentially what he had his, he instructed his field workers to do was to knock on the doors of mixed race people, introduce themselves, explain them what they were doing and collect genealogical data, ancestry data, to have them actually roll up their sleeves and have their skin colors graded by a color top where the field worker would just subjectively eyeball how many percentages of black, of red, of yellow, of white that they saw mixed on a color wheel. So this is the precision data collection that Davenport relies on in, in doing these studies. Now, yes, it's very subjective, of course, um, but it's quite interesting to dig into the correspondence and sort of the language that he uses when he talks to his research assistants in getting this data and the sort of assumptions about slavery in the background. So if we think about slavery in Jamaica, it's a black majority island. Um, there are a few white planters, typically male uh, white planters that um, lived on the island. But Davenport has to present this data to, the, to an American audience. So he can't really say there was rampant racial intermixture and there's a lot of like sexual exploitation going on in, in, um, in plantations. That would be inflammatory. So he kind of sidesteps this, but you know that he knows how this mixed race population came to be. So, so let me explain. Um, Davenport would assume that the black women who his researchers were interviewing were possibly promiscuous. Um, so he played up this idea of black women being naturally promiscuous. What he also did was he got photographs of mixed race families. And what he would do is he would write down, the text would say cohabitating or husband, and it would be either an Englishman, an Irishman, a white person, and then have the, the, the wife being black. But in the photographs, there are no white fathers. They're not there. What he would do is he would ask his um, researchers, um, so for example, his co-author, Morris de Gerda, he would basically ask him for photographs of contrasting skin color between offspring and the parent, but the parent was almost always the mother. He said, quote, don't forget the disharmony. One problem I might suggest, that of colored children from past for white parents. Are there such? If so, mail, mail me the case with photographs and assurances of the trustworthiness of the mother with respect to paternity, end quote. In another instance, he wrote, it is very important to get the genealogical genealogical data from every one of the 200 Negroes and mulattoes. Find out if they have lighter brothers and sisters and the presence of white ancestry through three generations, end quote. Now, what he's doing is he's basically saying, I want color contrasts. I want you to show me these, these great aged sort of families. But what's interesting is that when he has a family that is a mixed race family, if they're very light skinned, they're always called um, near whites or pass for whites. The fathers are also called near whites or pass for whites. He never just has them as white. And what's interesting is that in this series of photos, he asked for fair skinned babies from dark mothers. Now, when you would think of doing like a family tree, father, mother, offspring, no father. There is no father in these pictures, which to me suggests that the white father is hidden in plain sight. The first thing you're thinking if you're crossing two generations, you wanna see the parents and there is just one parent missing. And the idea here is that he's wanting to contrast these dark skinned women with these light skinned babies, but not showing this white father, which I think has a lot to do with um, the issues of sort of where mixed race people came from and the politics of racial crossing that linger over from the era of slavery. So in a letter he writes to Morris de Gerda, he said he wanted genealogical data involving, quote, mulatto children in which the mother is of full black blood or nearly so, and the father white, end quote. Well, here's the photograph. There's the data that's published, no photograph of the father. So the observer can really only assume that the photograph light-skinned children were produced from the union of the photographed dark-skinned mother and the absent white father. So as a result, the role of white men in creating mixed race offspring remained conveniently hidden in plain sight. So I just wanna wrap up here because I know I've given you a lot of interesting things to think about here, but I wanna just sort of, um, just kind of conclude here by saying, you know, well, first of all, why does this matter? What does this mean? 
I've given you several distinct examples of how the topic of mixed race people created anxiety in various parts of American society from scientists to nosy neighbors to US Army anthropologists and physicians. And some of this is naturally very period, but what my research is showing is that this disparate use of sources were part of a larger medical discourse that sought to reify race and prove racial hierarchy. Indeed, race has enjoyed a long career as a useful, even a vague proximate marker of bodily difference on which medicine and other allied scientific fields depend. In fact, we still inhibit a world, inhabit a world, excuse me, where race causes mischief and damage in the realm of medical decision-making. Race still exists as something that we think of as real and possibly biological. Race can appear in actual medical apparatuses like this barometer, which has race correction built into it. I should add that in those army um, anthropology studies, they used spirometers and basically said, okay, black people have smaller lung capacity. So Lundy Braun has spoken about this um, quite eloquently. Um, so that's something from the 19th century and I understand that spirometers are still in use. We could maybe think of something that's a little bit more recent in terms of thinking about race correction and the idea of race as biology. And that of course would be the EGFR of which I know my audience is totally very familiar. So I'm hoping that in the Q and A, you guys will teach me a little bit about what your thoughts are about the EGFR, which um, does indeed have race correction built into it. And this is again for the measuring of kidney function. And so I, I am pleased to know that this is a discussion happening amongst physicians about the EGFR, talking about you know, what should we do instead of using the race correction. Um, so I know that that is a conversation that's happening, um, but part of what I hope to do with this scholarship um, is to think about how blackness has been assumed to be a part of one's biology and how that assumption didn't happen in a vacuum and how this is actually part of a systemic problem in medical knowledge production um, related to race. So what I really am seeing with my, or hoping with my current work is to amplify this problem of scientific knowledge production that sort of has reified race. Um, and I try to do this, as I said, by bringing together history of medicine, slavery, African-American history, um, and I would say that to investigate slavery era roots of eugenic studies of mixed race people in the early 20th century is in a sense to study the far and enduring reach of anti-blackness in scientific research. One of the many lasting consequences of slavery was the rendering of blackness as a legible, discrete, physiological, phenotypic trait. Looking at race and more specifically blackness in this way is instructive for revealing the subtle and explicit ways we think about and talk about race with vocabularies that are rooted in biology with assumptions that race is a tangible thing, despite knowing that race is a social construction and not a biological fact. Thank you. Well, Rana, that was terrific and um, very, 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 um, you, you took something that I think many of us are struggling with because we're living through this moment where we're really rethinking and, re and understanding things in a new way and I just love you. You used a couple of things that I definitely loved. I love optically, socially, and politically. That is just a terrific line. Um, and uh, racially deterministic ideas. I, I just think this is interesting. I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute, but I couldn't help thinking when you were talking about these race crossing experiments, just like kind of the background of not only eugenics, but the whole genetic revolution and the whole idea of like, you know, like breeding different plants and breeding different pigs and, you know, this idea of having like, you know, healthy babies and bigger livestock and, you know, it, it just, it, it just kept making me think about the, the, um, the, like the analogies to those things. And also I did not realize the sanitary commission that you went back in and were looking at that, I think was terrific because if there's one lesson from this whole series is that it is incredible to look at primary sources. Like you showed that from the, the, the precursor of the New England Journal of Medicine. I mean, just looking back at these old articles is just, it's fascinating on every way. And this stuff is available online. So, Anybody can go, you know, in our library, we actually have our librarian on this um, talk. Uh, she, she actually tracks the references and is going to help me put together references at the end. So, but, um, you know, I love the, the primary sources because I think there's nothing like reading the language in your own 
reading it yourself because sometimes you're really struck by either how harsh or how different or you know it just strikes you in a very visceral way yeah no totally i mean i i love sharing my primary sources as a historian like especially if i'm speaking to like um audiences that are not always historians you know if i just say i'm like oh yeah this person said this about race and they're like well what do you mean i'm like let me let me show you let me like roll up our sleeves and, and come with me into the archives and sit with me and think about like what all of this means but also at paying attention to the context right like so for me, I think that's what makes um, being a historian super fun. I love going to the archives. The archives are like my dream. I love just being in the archives and reading. And so all the librarians and archivists out there like very much appreciate everything you do. <laughs> right, but the other thing I just wanted to say was um, talk a little, I, I'm really interested in this concept because you, you made links that I never really thought of before, like this concept of passing, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? In terms of like this, racial dilution, you know what I mean? Um, I am very interested in hearing your thoughts about that just because, um, I don't know, I, I just think that it's, is it still as much of an issue now? I mean, clearly there was a time when if you were identified as black, even though optically you looked at white, it had huge consequences, but is, you know, there are different consequences in the modern world, right? And different you know, hierarchies and different, um, the sociology is really fascinating about, you know, um, just the whole gradation of color and what that means and what it means to actually, the idea of passing is so, also so provocative and so charged, you know, passing is like you're getting through something, you're going, you know, it feels very illicit, you know. Yeah, no, so I should say passing is, uh, so that brings up colorism and like how these studies, so I should say colorism of course still exists today. It's still very much a problem for um, lighter skinned people feeling, getting getting preference over darker skinned people or the idea of comfort level, um, people feeling like sociologists have measured this, right? They've seen that people who tend to go higher in certain, you know, corporate organizations or who present themselves in a certain way. It's like, if you're lighter skinned, it tends to show better opportunities or better treatment because of this assumption about dark skin. And this is very much true actually in Jamaica. So I'm, I'm a Jamaican person, it's like cards on the table. Um, and certainly colorism is, is a concern in terms of, you know, who tends to be wealthier, who tends to get better access, who can tends to get treated differently, you know, differently. So that still does exist. And I would argue that it still exists today in the United States. I think part of the issue with um, the race crossing studies, and, and even when I had mentioned um, African-American eugenesis is there is a concern when people use language to describe favorably. So saying that the hair, for example, is of a tolerable length or that it's smooth and curly and not kinky. That plays into today the politics of policing um, black women's hair, for example. Like we see this in the news, like having dreadlocks, having curly hair, not professional hair. This is all bound up with assumptions about what is considered to be attractive, acceptable, or what kind of percentage of whiteness you have and what comfort level then that, that sort of can afford someone. And I think that for passing, you know, I, I haven't seen the new Netflix movie passing that in its, the director herself actually has a history of, of passing in her family that she certainly, she realized. But the point here is that um, passing was often a way for some people of African descent to, to negotiate life without being, without having the obstacles of racism thrown in their face every single day. Um, obviously some people chose to do that, some people did not, right? So there's the famous story, um, you know, Walter, Walter White for the, from you know, he, he could go into the South, report on lynching, and he had blue eyes and, and blonde hair and light skin, and nobody nobody knew he was a Black person, so he could walk right in there and, and do it, and then when he was found out, he had to, like, leave town immediately, so there are all these, like, mythologies about, um, you know, mixed race people being able to infiltrate in some ways, other people just trying to make a living, so there's actually a really fascinating ebony magazine from 1952 or 1950, I think it's 52, around the time of the UNESCO statement on race, but the actual Ebony magazine has a spread of mixed race people, it's in black and white, and it says who is black and who is not. And it's a quiz for an African-American audience. They can you tell 
who's black and who's who's not black. And there's a series of news articles about black people who've been passing. So unbeknownst to their white colleagues in, you know, in the cubicle, the secretaries where they are black people. So it says, you know, um, white by day, black by night. So these were actual, this actually happens. This there's a very long history of this. And, and part of what I'm hoping to do with this study, because it is in the, the early stages, is I wanted to explore the scientific and medical component of this, the idea of passing, the gradation of skin color, the significance of that. But I believe that this work is in direct conversation with other historical works that look at the, so, the, 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 the social and political aspects of passing and how that is still a kind of issue today. Um, even thinking about, you know, who gets to be considered black or white. Um, I can think of, you know, Meghan Markle's children who, you know, that, that oh, what will they look like? Do you know what I mean? Like that is of course still present with us. Like today. what features will they have? Like people are allegedly somebody in the royal family is concerned about this. So um, yeah, it's still with us today. And, and passing, I, I feel like there's a really great book um, by Alison Hobbs. She's at Stanford and she's written a wonderful book um, on sort of the, the history and, and politics of, of passing. And the name of her book will come to me in a moment, but it's Alison Hobbs. Um, I, I had a chance to meet her virtually and she's just delightful. Apropos to that, just uh, Dorian Miller, one of my colleagues wrote, excellent talk, the implications of colorism and how it plays out. Individual families is the source of intergenerational trauma. I think that's an ex uh, yes. comment. But I just want to let the audience know, Rana has something to do this afternoon. So if yeah. he has any questions, comments, you know, we're not, uh, she's not going to be here at the three o'clock thing. So I encourage you to have a conversation with her while we still are lucky enough to have her, especially since this is such a rich topic. And so, you know, we're in such a moment where these things are being rethought and looked at in a way, just like you were talking about the EGFR. I mean, um, you know, it's interesting to see the backstory about why that came to be and the, you know, at least part of it is just, just like you were talking about these observable differences, right? You know, and one of the big questions, at least historically is why do African Americans, when you control for access to care, socioeconomic status, all these other things seem to have, let's say, higher rates of end-stage renal disease in the setting of hypertension. I mean, obviously there's a, some differences are obvious, right? If somebody doesn't have blood pressure, if they don't get their blood pressure managed, of course it doesn't surprise that somebody who's got uncontrolled hypertension for years will go on to develop end-stage renal disease. Or the issue with why um, African-American physicians, you know, women who are like in, you know, embedded in healthcare system, why they have poor outcomes after deliveries, why they have higher rates of things like preeclampsia and adverse effects, even though they're actually, it's not for not having care and they're part of the system and they're, you know, have ostensibly equity in, you know, um, things we would say are confounding variables. So I think this is really a, a fascinating, um, fascinating talk and I, would love some of the audience to, you know, either ask questions or continue the conversation because it's not so often you have the opportunity to really kind of not only look at the historical aspects, but um, we have some another thing. I'm just going to read some of the things from the chat, Ron, is um, one of our colleagues, Richie Khan, said, how would Davenport explain the success of black, mixed, et cetera, in college and professional sports? Um, so that is an excellent, excellent question because um, in some of his uh, measurements of um, mixed race people and black people in Jamaica, he makes commentary about their um, length of their legs and musculature. So he sees in some ways, and so this is, I, I mentioned this because he thinks that in some ways, uh, so-called Negro features, they might be more robust at certain things physically. So for example, while their lung capacities, their, their, their um, 
they're, if we look at spirometer measurements, their lung capacities are supposed to be lower. This is from the 19th century, but Davenport actually finds not really a big problem with their, their, their chest circumference and actually finds that they have long muscular legs. Now, I would say he actually measured uh, the men in Jamaica he, choose, he chose to measure were actually trying out for the police force or the fire brigade. So they, they generally tended to be in like would have been in good health. So his data sample is all the healthiest black men and brown men he could find in Jamaica. Um, but he did see that he suggested that on average, um, black people tended to have longer limbs. Um, they had good muscle tone. Now, the interesting thing is that I believe um, it is W. Montague Cobb at Howard who tries to push back on these claims of athleticism that the so-called like Jesse Owens is like because of his blackness and, and that's why he, he um, you know, excels back in field. Um, so you have other physical anthropologists pushing back on this idea that they are naturally superior at, at, at athletics. But I think Davenport would probably agree that in some physical ways, um, African Americans do quite well, or people of African descent. He also believes this in terms of um, music and um, being able to memorize or keep a tune. So he actually has several of the um, his research subjects do um, tests for like music and harmony, and he says that black people excel when it comes to music. Which I'm like, okay, this sounds like a stereotype I've heard before. So he like talks about this and and does these tests and, and it affirms this. But yes, I think he would actually agree with the idea that um, black people are suited or better at certain things than whites and, and other groups. But in terms of the intelligence, not so much. And he still thinks that if you actually mix them together, and this is the part of his study that got widely panned. He claimed that because black people had generally had longer legs, because white people had shorter arms, that mixed race people would have a hard time picking things up off the ground. I'm not actually kidding. He put that in his study and was just torn to shreds by any respectable biologist who read it. They were like, are you, are you serious? That's a conclusion that he did come up with. So um, yes, to the point of athletics, um, I think he would see some kind of an advantage. Let me um, give another comment here. Mike Massal wrote, and apropos to what you said before about how Eugenics wasn't a fringe concept. This no. was mainstream. This was, I mean, you know, the people who were supportive of this were in, you know, uh, high level. And he writes, Charles Davenport, Charles Davenport was a person in power as a college professor yep. at Spring Harbor in his international founding of the International Federation of Eugenics and had immeasurable policy consequences. He was also a racist polemicist who violated many ethical and scientific principles and was responsible for the widespread beliefs that pellagra, alcoholism, bipolar, criminality, and inter intellectual disability were driven by immigration and people of color diluting the white gene uh, germplasm. The entire eugenics movement was criticized for being supposedly based on racist and classist assumption set out to prove the unfitness of the wide sections of the American population, which Davenport and his followers had considered degenerate, using methods criticized even by the British eugenicists as scientific. And it's just interesting, you know, the one of the things you learn as you read this history is how powerful the terminology is. When I see degenerate, it reminds me of the degenerate art, you know, where the Nazis decided that a lot of the, you know, mm -hmm new um, art was degenerate and therefore should be destroyed. So it is interesting how these political movements, the language becomes tainted and fraught and just charged. So oh, yes. So I just want to say that this, the comment is absolutely spot on. Davenport is awful. He, so what he represented was, I think, the worst, this terrible abuse um, of, of science is running to basically just wanting to confirm right, a priori assumptions. And I should say that part of the reason why I focused on mixed race people is because, you know, I think of um, Alexandra Minister's work on eugenics. I think about Daniel Kevlis's work on eugenics. Um, I think, is it Robert Proctor's books on like sort of the Nazi doctor? Like people have, Davenport is essentially, as far as I'm concerned, has zero credibility as a proper scientist. And he, he lost that credibility. I think the commenter is absolutely correct. Is Carl Pearson, who dabbled in eugenics, who used to be buddy-buddy with Davenport, 
tore Race Crossing in Jamaica to shreds. He's one of the reviewers that just hated it. And they had a huge fight about the segregation of traits and the pattern. Like, so yes, even terrible British eugenicists who also had their own classist um, political agendas were like, this is just wrong. So it, it's kind of interesting. Davenport to me, I'm, I'm focusing on him because he was so very, very wrong at the time. But also it's interesting to think that the, the history of his focus on mixed race people, like so has not been sort of put up there. So we can talk about alcoholism, evil-mindedness, which is a nonsense term. That was a completely socially constructed term at that time. It was clearly ableist. It targeted poor whites. It targeted um, immigrants. It's just like clear, right? And so it's very easy for us now to be like, this is just nonsense. But when I look at the fact that like the Social Science Research Council, what it is now, at one point in time was sponsoring the Committee on the Study of the Negro, that you had all of the best and brightest come together and sit down so this is what I mean, these were people in power. These were people who were taken quite seriously. And I think this is part of what for me is exciting as the historian is to go back and understand like how did that process happen? And I don't wanna just dismiss them. I wanna think about like sort of what, what is the nitty gritty details of how figures like that could gain such ascendancy who could sort of have their credibility, right? He, I mean, even after race crossing into Jamaica is like utterly dragged, um, he still is, is measuring black people in Alabama. He's still being asked to do measurements. He's, he doesn't sort of just um, completely disappear as one would think. No, and I think you just made the argument for why it's really important to study history because, you know, and it will be interesting for us as we live through this moment, what the future will say about this time. And um, I just often think about uh, down the road how um, Trump's presidency will be viewed in some future lens, but um, this was really terrific, Ron. It was a great, uh, it was great on every level. It was an important topic. You know, Davenport is a great point of opportunity. You gave us a lot of other links to other um, resources that we can take a look at. And I think this idea of these race crossing and thinking about that, I just think was really, uh, very instructive and enlightening and i just uh i think everybody here really appreciated your time and we'll look forward to hearing more on your future projects so i want to thank you mark thank you so rana you want to say anything or elena i i want to thank rana so much for, for beautiful talk and uh, i mean th things that i had never heard about or known about and and it was very instructive um, and just to remind the, the audience um, that, that we're going to have two weeks off now um, and we'll resume our programs, um, the, the whole um, uh, fellowship program will be resumed on Wednesday, April 6th. Um, and who, who will be our speaker on Wednesday, April 6th? It's, it's our friend Caleb Alexander. Ah, from Hopkins, yeah. Alexander yeah. talking about um his topic that he always does it's called patients providers and pharmaceuticals in the 21st century so i want to thank everybody for those of you who actually are lucky enough to get a vacation enjoy your vacation when you come back just bring back some of the spring that's the only thing i ask of you <laughs> so have a wonderful time thanks